months, the Uber Highland Falls branch of the NOSCP has been in dialogue on several occasions with members of the Board of Education of the Uber School District uh, regarding pertinent issues that need attention. Uh, this meeting has been called as a special meeting uh, in order that our community can be informed and updated on the, on the nature and the extent of those meetings. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us our regional director of the NAACP, Mr. Wilbur Aldrich, along with other persons, some present and not present, Mr. Constance Frazier, who is president, Dr. Oscar Cohen, who is not present tonight, uh, who have also been appointed to work along with the Newburgh College Ball Branch in in this issue. So at this time, I want to turn the meeting over to Mr. Aldridge for further information. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Uh, how many of you are NAACP members? Would you raise your hand? Okay, good. The majority of you. That's great. All right. Um, as you know, we initially came here involving because of the incident that occurred. I will quickly realize that the magnitude of this problem is much greater than any one incident. Uh, the incident was only a symptom of how sick your system, your school district really is. <laughs> uh, and it is, it is really ill. Okay. Uh, we have met with them, we first met with them in, I believe, May. Around May 4th. At that time, we had submitted to them a letter asking for a suspic uh, any big word I have. Suspic. No, no, no. Oh, specific there it is. information uh, regarding, for an example, uh, the number of, of class students that have been classified as with disability number of students that were, uh, and this is by race and ethnicity, everything was by race and ethnicity. Uh, the number of uh, students who had been suspended uh, were by race and ethnicity, both percentage and raw number, because sometimes things are hidden in percentages uh, will not necessarily reflect the actual number of people involved. So we asked for that information. We also asked for the staffing by race uh, and ethnicity. Uh, the number of principals, the number of teachers, the number of principals, the number of assistant principals, paraprofessionals. Uh, then we asked for, all of this is by race and ethnicity. Then we asked for the number of students who attended four-year colleges by race and ethnicity. There are those that were planning to attend two-year colleges. The number of students planning to work, uh, planning to just go to work by race and ethnicity. And the number of placements uh, unknown by race and ethnicity. We asked for the dropout rate uh, based upon race and ethnicity, the number of students transferring by race and ethnicity, the education, the graduates, special education graduates for 2008, 2009, 2010. We asked for a summary of the district's performance, uh, three through eight. Uh, the percentage of stu students scoring above level and those that were not, uh, and mainly in uh, English, math, and science. We also asked the district to give us uh, the percentage of students uh, scoring above level, at or above level, on the state uh, test secondary level by ethnicity and race. That was in English and math. We asked for um, any students failing more than two subjects uh, by the end of the school year. We asked for various other, other things, all by race and ethnicity. Now, if you go on to the state website, the state ed website, you will see a report card, and it gives you exactly where your district is right, right. by race and ethnicity. When you look at that, it indicates that most students African-American students and Hispanic students are failing or below standard 
in math and language arts. Now, if you can't talk, read, and write, there's very little chance that you're going to be really successful at too many things. Now, we got all of that data back. That data was evaluated by Dr. Coyne and Mrs. Frazier. First, let me tell you, Dr. Coyne is a former superintendent of schools from New York City. Uh, who's very familiar with state regs, the requirements. Uh, and one of the things that you have to know is what you don't know. Now, I know I don't know all of that, so therefore I pull in folks who can help me. Uh, Mrs. Frazier, sitting to my left, as a former superintendent of schools in uh, New York and New Jersey. So therefore, they certainly are more familiar with what the rules and regulations are. Based upon that, we then looked at the Newburgh School District, and when I tell you it came up wanting, I don't want to really tell you that, but it was. It was probably, compared to other districts that we have looked at, at the bottom of the list. Uh, and that was because, and Mrs. Frazier will give you some more information on that, but what we also discovered was many of the people in the Newburgh School District, they have all kinds of policies, but they don't follow their policies. So if you got a policy and you don't follow it, you're just going to not have it. Now, Mrs. Frazier will also enlighten you to the fact that many of the policies involving your children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, whoever, are outdated. Those policies are supposed to be reviewed every year by the board. That has not occurred in many instances, not for everything. There are some things that are up to date, most of it isn't. When we looked at to see about the mix as far as uh, teachers were concerned, and I, and, and I may be quoting this wrong, and, and Mrs. Frazier will correct me if I'm wrong, I think you have a total of 17 African American teachers in the entire district, when you have 47% of the kids that are African-American, or Hispanic. Now, certainly some move should have been made to ensure that your district is reflective of the people who they're serving. That has not happened. Um, I will tell you that we have come down very hard on the board as well as the administrators. We certainly are not the most favorite people in the whole wide world, but that's not why I'm in this business. So it's not up to, I'm not, I didn't come here looking for friends. I came to try and correct the situation. We have told them, point blank, that either things were going to change and change rapidly, or we have no choice but to go to the feds for civil rights, as well as to the state aid department. Now that's clear. That does not mean that we're not willing to work with them if indeed they are showing a good faith effort to correct some of these inequities. Now, what we've also told them is they don't have five years to do that. Because if it takes five years, that's five years of children that have left ill prepared. One of the reasons, and I will be in that, some of the stuff I'm going to say to you that you're not necessarily going to like, but I'm just putting it out there because that's the way I see it. One of the reasons we believe that Newburgh looks the way it looks is because you have not produced a crop of people to prepare to make it better. Okay. <laughs> now, if you had done that, I wouldn't say it, would, it wouldn't look like this. It probably would be better or you have more people willing to come in and use expertise who have gone and gotten additional expertise to do what needs to be done, um, such as community organization, to get things moving so you can get rid of some of the abandoned buildings and stuff, which certainly makes it look worse than it is. Problem. You also have been the number one murder place in the country. And that's really not I'm not sure. I'm, I'm talking about New York State, not the whole country. The point is it's been safe. 
the murder count. Whether it's true or not, it's been saved. If it wasn't nothing was happening, you wouldn't have to worry about it. You know what I'm saying? That's right. You have a crime problem in the murder. Whether you want to call it number one or number ten, you have a problem. Now, the point is, if your children were well educated, they would not have to commit crimes. So don't get defensive because, you know, let me clear this up too. For some reason, people have thought that it's our, it's our job to come in and correct this. It's not. It's your job. You live here. I live in Rockland. So it's up to you. We provide technical assistance. And I've been in Newburgh more in the past four months than I've been in 15 years. So if you're going to get defensive, get defensive with yourself. Because you, that's the appearance of what's here. Now, with that said, what we have done is truly put them on notice that what the NAACP is going to do. Most of the issues that we have talked about, that I just mentioned to you, uh, have been presented to Mrs. Dukes, uh, the New York State President, who is fully aware of what's happening, as well as the National Office. The NAACP has taken a firm stance, not only in Newburgh, but throughout the country, and as I know I have, especially in my region, that we're going to clean up all of this inequity as far as schools are concerned. So, with that in mind, I'm going to ask, because I don't want to be here all night, and I know you don't either, I'm going to ask Mrs. Frazier to give you some specifics pertaining to some of the things that we've gone over with the district and what we've asked them to provide us in January. And I'm talking about things that they have changed by January. Now, I'm going to say this, and then I'll turn it over. Whatever we create with your school district, you have got to maintain. We are not coming back and forth to check. You, and I say you, meaning the entire community, working with your local branch, have got to put yourself in the position of maintaining. You had a court decree That's right. in Newburgh in 1974, which said that the, the suspension rate was supposed to go down to zero in five years. Now, because they still have a district, obviously it went to zero. But then, nobody looked. So, you know, when the when, what's that, what's that phrase, when the, uh, when the wolf, something about the chicken house, you know, that's you know, that phrase. All right, so now, your suspension rate is through the roof. Your suspension rate is through the roof. We have asked, told them about alternative schools where you don't have to suspend kids, you send them to an alternative school. In that school, you provide what they need to try and get them on track socially, as well as educationally. We've given them a program that we know has worked, which is not that far for them to go see. To date, I don't know if they've gone to see it or not. I will certainly know by January. I'll probably know before January, because I don't go. I never go anywhere asking questions that I don't already have an answer. So, I, but the point is that they have their things, that we, specific things that we've given them. So, it's up to them. <clears throat> now, I'm going to say this. I'm trying to get ready. I ain't going to stop a minute. <laughs> um, you don't have enough on the school board. That, that, right. And 40, 47 or 43 or 45 percent of the kids are either Hispanic and or are African American. You certainly need to be more represented than one. That's right. But you got to do that. You need to organize. You should be registering everybody that you can possibly find to vote. I and get out of this business of status and and who's got this and who's got that. I don't care if they're if they're breathing, walking, talking, and capable of understanding. You need to register them to vote. I don't care if they're sleeping on the sidewalk. And then after you 
register, then you got to get them there. But you have to do that. Now, I'll give you a perfect example of how it can be done. I don't like what I'm telling you, but it can be done. There's a group in Rockland that took over one of the districts in Rockland. Well, wasn't African American, but they took over. Mm -hmm. Because they all got together. They all said they were going to vote one way. They got 10,000 people, and they all went to the poll and voted. <laughs> so the school board, at that point, is no longer anywhere near what the makeup was before. Amen. Now, I'll tell you, it was my city. Yep. And they have taken over one of the school districts in Rockland. All right, except with the exception of two African Americans being on there. So that's the way of the shape of power. So if you don't like how you now I saw the article that somebody wrote somewhere. Um, if you don't like what your school board's doing, then it's up to you to change it. Right. Now I know you had a school board election a while ago, and nobody, nothing changed. <laughs> now whose fault is that? I look out here. If there's a Hispanic person, I can't, I can't identify it by look. But you need to coalesce with the Hispanic folks to get something changed. So, because it ain't about you. It's about your kids. And I'm using that term generic. Okay, I'm, I'm finished. For the moment, I may jump in as you're talking. First of all, I want to say good evening, and I am honored and very humbled to be here. Uh, I came from another meeting, and I told him I had the meeting at his house because we're trying to select a CEO of Rockland County uh, to represent mental health uh, for their board. So I bring you greetings from mental health, and after you folks reorganize, you may need mental health. <laughs> we already do. That's okay. God is on your side. I was a school board president and a vice president at a very young age. You know, makeup does wonderful things, especially fashion fair. Oh, so I really clearly understand the dynamics of all the things that God has put in my path to have me do to help children that look like me. And I've always been very, very grateful for the opportunity as an elementary principal in Yonkers, as a high school principal in Inglewood, New Jersey, as an assistant superintendent in Plainfield, New Jersey, as an assistant superintendent in Hempstead, as an associate superintendent in Jersey City, and as an interim superintendent of schools, and a assistant superintendent in Orange, where I just recently retired from, but you never retire. Once an educator, always an educator. Okay. Now, let me give you some demographics. You have a lot of children in this school system that deserve a quality education. Right. And nothing less than that is acceptable. If you look on the internet, you will find your BEDS report or your state report card. And it's usually a year behind. So 2009 and 10, you had 11,644 students in the school district. That would be for like the last school year. Let me give you a breakdown on the percentages because this is the way the state sets it up so that you'll have an understanding. Your American Indian slash Alaskan Native, you had 26 children enrolled that belonged to that particular, particular ethnic group. So that was a zero percentage because unless you have more than 50, you don't really register. African American or black, you had 3,367. That was a percentage of 29, 29%. Asian or Pacific Islander, uh, 279 students, gave you a percentage of two. Hispanic, Latina, 4,767, which gave you a percentage of 41. And white, 3,205, which gave you a percentage of 28. Now that's the district enrollment for 11,644 children. That's a lot of kids. Now when you look at your staff that has been hired to teach in the system over the past 40 years, it hasn't changed very much. Um, most of the folks look like that door in the back. 
I'm not being critical. What I'm saying is constructive, but I speak the truth because it's based on my 44 years of experience of working in a lot of different districts, urban, rural, and suburban. You can't teach what you don't know, and you can't administer what you don't know, and you can't retire on a job if you're committed and care about kids. Now, when Wilbur said that we had been up here a number of times, I've been several times, but in between that, I've done a lot of research on your district. And when I say a lot, I don't mean that to quantify it so it sounds minuscule, it's a lot. Everything that a school district does is predicated on your board, policies, and the procedures. And the reason why I stress that, the policies are bylaws based on legal precedent. They tell what the board wants to have done. Those procedures that are in place attached or align with the policies tell who's supposed to do it, when they're supposed to do it, and why they're supposed to do it. You don't have to write any of this down. If you want, I'll email it to you, okay? I just want you to take it in and swish it around and download it in your episodic memory because you folks have a lot to do to change this place, and you can do it. You can do it. It's doable. One of the things that was very helpful for me to get a, a handle on what was going on, I took a look at every policy in this district every last one. There are 10 different series, and they start from 000. zero, zero. Those are the bylaws. And it runs from 1000, which is mostly dealing with, um, I guess you could say administration. Then you have 2000, which is instruction. You have um, 5000, which is your kids, and that's the most important one. Those are the ones that are the longest. And what I found to be absolutely incredulous was the fact that many policies were adopted in 1982 and we're now in 2011 and they haven't been revised. That's unacceptable. Now, how do you go about changing that? First of all, based on what I just said, the foundation for your school district is your board policies and procedures. Once you get them updated, you have to monitor it. Now, how many of you know about Frederick Douglass? Great. How many of you know about Abraham Lincoln? Great. And you know what Frederick Douglass did? He was gently leaning over Lincoln to make him do the right thing. Okay? So they think he freed the slaves. You folks are going to have to be the Frederick Douglasses for your district. Gently leaning over the Board of Ed to make them do the right thing. Because see, the man up above watches all. But he doesn't want any slouches down here that take care of our business. Now let me tell you what I did in the process of doing a complete thorough analysis of all of the board policies and procedures. Some of them co-mingled the bylaws with the policies. Some of them didn't even have any procedures attached to them, so you didn't know what to do, who to do it with, and when to do it. So what I did was an errata sheet for each policy. If it needed to be updated, I said that. If it needed to be revised, I said that. And I even made suggestions as a whole how to go about setting up the procedures. You cannot have board policies, folks, without the accompanying procedures. It doesn't work. And if you do it that way, any other way other than having, it's like a marriage. You gotta have a man and a woman. Yes, these days you have just about anything, but you could do it. You gotta have two parties, okay? And one goes with the other. So if you don't have that, what you have is one foot in one place and one in the other. Now a lot of people don't look at it and they don't think it's important. Let me tell you some of the kinds of questions that I asked that I expected to get responses to. Just give you a flavor, okay? First one was, has a professional development plan, corrective action plan, been implemented and developed for the 2011-2012 school year? That's a powerhouse question. And the reason why it's important, it speaks to what kind of development ongoing or what kind of plan you have in place that's aligned inextricably to your curriculum to make sure the kids get what they're supposed to get and make sure the teachers know what they're supposed to get. Are they current? Have you hired highly qualified teachers that are familiar not just with the core curriculum content standards, because if you teach that, kids are just going to get it minimal. 
have to teach way beyond core con curriculum content standards. I'm a curriculum person, I guess you can tell. If you do not have a curriculum that is aligned, you got yourself a hot mess. Because nobody knows what they're supposed to be teaching. And the reason why I mention that, in kindergarten, what body of knowledge does a child need to learn to get from kindergarten to first grade? You know what you had to learn in first grade? What body of knowledge does a youngster need to know to get from first to second grade? Are your kids looped? Do you have the same teacher two years in a row so you have to reteach in September? There are a lot of different things that are going on that need to be looked at. The one thing I want you to take away tonight, this system has to move into the 21st century. You folks are not even in the 20th century. You're in the 19th. That's not a criticism, that's just an observation, because I'm here to help you. I'm not critical, okay? I'm, I'm kind, but I tell the truth. Has a corrective action plan been developed and implemented to address the November 15, 1974 consent decree and the goals to eliminate racial disparities and suspension rates for students in grades 7 through 12? You heard? Well, we'll speak about that. This is 2011. That happened in 1974. What has been done from 1974 to 2011? How dare you not fix it? How dare you not fix it? Now if I sound impassioned and emotional about it, I am, but sometimes black kids get ripped off, I'm gonna be there to make sure we fix it. Is there an administrator's leadership academy being implemented to provide ongoing staff development? How do you begin school? You come together for a couple of days, what do you do, have coffee? What do you do that's constructive? What is planned? What's your plan? Do you have a strategic plan in this district? Anybody know? You know why you don't have one? And I'll tell you the response I got, and I sat there and smiled, because sometimes people think you're stupid. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Now, the reason why I'm taking some time, I just want to give you another flavor on some of the questions I ask about pupils. I did it before I reviewed the policies, and I did it after. And it was interesting to me how there was some congruence before and after. How, who will monitor and who will decide regarding behavior? This has to do with one of the policies. How many students were enrolled in the district's pre-K program for the 2009-2010 and the 2010-2011 school year? What is the current all-day kindergarten enrollment? 2011-2012 for the African American and Hispanic students. Somebody mentioned in the meeting, oh, see if we do all kinds of celebrations and whatnot. When I looked at the policy that reflected what celebrations were conducted, I didn't see Kwanzaa there. Right. I was like, what is this? So you see, when I'm talking about, you have to be current and you have to be culturally diverse so that you have, you have to take into consideration the kind of children you're teaching. You have to be aware of their mores and folk ways. You have to have professional development programs in the district for both administrators and teachers that will help them in a brief the world of differences of beginning. Now, one of the things that we asked on that note uh, had to do with whether they have done any cultural competence training in the staff in this district. The answer was no. Well, that's why you have such problems pertaining to not understanding the culture of the children. And based upon not understanding those cultures, many of the things that they display you might find uh, either threatening or offensive when in reality it's part of their culture. So if you do the cultural competence, then the teachers and the staff will become much more aware of these things, and therefore you're able to divert some of that. In addition to that, if you are culturally competent, then you know what, what holidays or what occasions are important to your students. If you are not culturally competent, then you're not going to be aware, so you would have no reason to celebrate. Uh, we're saying that that's something that they have to do and have to implement right away. The other, thanks, Wilbur. The other thing that I want to mention to you is on that note, I had a library in my house and I went through some of the books that I thought would be relevant 
and I ticked off about 18. I'm going to share some of them with you. You make a little note in your mind about all the ones that you know about and if they're in the library in your schools. It's very, very important. Saving the African American Child. Most likely that would not be there. I'm going to give you a copy of the brought you here. That comes from Dr. the late Dr. Asa Hilliard, who was my mentor, and the late Dr. Barbara Sizemo, who was also my mentor, and your mentor as well. I see a point. You go, girl. Um, and in line with that, The Miseducation of the Negro by Carnegie Woodson, okay, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, if you don't have it, Brenda Barnes and Nobles and get it. And the reason why Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, she talks about the pipeline. And the pipeline, you don't educate these kids, that's exactly where they're going to end up. You'll spend money to, to put them into prison as opposed to training in high school and regular school. Other People's Children, Lisa Delpit, she's excellent. If, if you haven't read her stuff, you need to. This is um, Results and Results Now by Schmoker. You cannot do anything in the school district without analyzing and disaggregating data. That is for your administrators and your teaching staff to become familiar with it. Um, anything that I'm telling you about, I've read it so I know about it, but you need to properly. If you have not read it, you need to get it. This is how you become the Frederick Douglass gently lean level thinking. <coughs> Testing African American Students by Dr. Asa Hilliard. Ten Steps to Helping Your Children Succeed in School by Michael Wynn. With the exception of Hilliard and Sizemore, all these people are available to come in and do training. And you have board members that are going to the National Alliance of Black School Educators. They're going to NAPC. I don't know what they're going for, but they're going to NAPC uh, in November. Uh, the Black Parents Handbook to Educate Your Children. Well, Rudy Gafeta had worked for me. He's one of the most outstanding young men you'll ever want to find. As a high former high school principal, he brings truth to justice, and he is excellent in working with parents. And you need that. Your parents need to be uplifted. A lot of parents don't know what to do when they get to the school. They go, oh my God, Jesus, help me. <coughs> because they don't want parents to come to school. If you don't, what you're supposed to be doing, parents should be welcome with open arms. Race Matters by Cornell West. Skillful leaders, skillful teachers. The Black Holocaust for Beginners. You all didn't even know that existed. It's a wonderful book by Dr. Anderson. You hear about the Jewish Holocaust, but you don't hear anything about the Black Holocaust. We have a Holocaust every day, just trying to live. Rallying the whole village, the Coma Process. You've heard of James Coma up at Yale University. They run a program up there that's outstanding. Um, they deal with uh, collaboration, consensus, and no fault. It would be worthy for some of your staff members to participate. I took my whole team, so we used to get immersed in everything. Creating Smart School, written by one of my colleagues, Dr. Judith Cronin, Restoring the Village, Jawanza Kajufu. You've heard about him. Small Learning Communities by Dr. Roberts. This is just a small list that I gave them. And also, I always try to put my money where my mouth is. I have books in the car to give to the assistant superintendent tonight. Okay. Now, Mr. Wilbur is a tough taskmaster, but he's a good person. And he gave a homework assignment to central office, to the board president, and to those board members that were present when we attended the meeting. And these are the things that we're looking for by January 12th. I couldn't bring the book tonight. You'll just have to take my word for it because it's too thick. It's like this. And it took me about two months to do it. All of the policies and procedures cannot be assessed at one time. They cannot all be revised at one time. So you have to chunk it. That's what we tell kids. Chunk the information. So what we ask them to do is revise and update by January 20th. 12, rather, the 000, those are the bylaws, 1,000, administration, 2,000, instruction, and 5,000 for pupils. That's a lot, but if they look at all the notes that I made on each one of those subsets, and I didn't give them the whole thing because it's just too much, it would be too overwhelming. New York State School Boards, you pay a lot of money for that service every year, and they have people that come and help you. And they help you cross-reference, they help you do everything that needs to be done. So it's not like they have to do it on their own or without some assistance. I will help them with it too if they need it. The other thing is, all of your job descriptions for your central office people are all out of whack. <laughs> not just the content, 
but the format. Does it need to be related? That's all. Well, you know, I'm not related to anybody up here, but the thing is, I, I got the sense, and I have to be honest with you, that if you're not in the old boys' network, you're in trouble. But if you get your power, if the district gets its policies and procedures together, and as Will pointed out, you become the Frederick Douglass, you can hold folks accountable. But if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. And if it's written down and you don't follow it, then that's where you can hold people accountable. You are the citizens in Newburgh, and you have every right to do that. And if they had followed their policies and procedures, they wouldn't have gotten in trouble with the kids. But letting them cut all those classes, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I used to go to Newburgh. I used to come here when I was a kid. I used to swim in that pool. So I know about Newburgh. Um, my cousin John Rebus, I think, was the first black principal in my family, if I recall correctly. The other thing that's most important that you may or may not be aware of, every district that has low test scores, you have to put together a corrective action plan. Well, what does that mean? You have to first understand what did the test scores mean. So that means you have to analyze the data, disaggregate it to make informed instructional decisions. Who does that? That is usually done by your building principal or instructional leader in collaboration with your teaching staff. And then you can organize it in different ways, different school districts do it differently. But be that as it may, that data has to be analyzed and it cannot be put on a shelf. It has to be used before children are placed in the classroom setting for the coming school year. That's what's usually done if it's done right. Now, to add insult to injury, if that doesn't happen, and I'll give you the analogy and then I promise to be quiet. When you get into an airplane and you're getting ready to depart from the airport, you usually get on the plane, you put your little overhead bag up in the thing, and you sit down, you put the seatbelt on, and somebody comes around, and they do their little cursory whatevers. But what the pilot and the co-pilot do up in the front, in the cockpit, is most interesting. What do you think they have to do? Check what? Who do they have to contact? The tower. Who's in the tower? Air traffic control. You get one of these. <laughs> and they do that because they have to file a flight plan. Yes. And the flight plan, you might be going to California, but if they don't file a flight plan, you might end up in Detroit. That's not where you intended to go. Anything that happens when you don't have policies and procedures in place, and you don't have the professional development plan or a corrective action plan or restructuring plan in place, you will, you will probably end up in Detroit, but it will be fortuitous, and they say it's by chance if you end up in California where you intended to go. This district needs a flight plan bad, and you need it yesterday. That's why when you have an administrator's academy at the beginning of the school year, I used to take all my people for four days. You know you had me for four days. So get used to my different color lipstick because we would be together. And you really sit down and plan what you're going to do for that school year. And you stick to it. Now go back to what I said initially. If you don't plan, you can't do anything. If you happen to land when you want to land at the end of the year, it's fortuitous. It's by chance. It wasn't because you planned it. Your kids deserve better. They deserve better. And you have children in the shoot for 12 years. Your pre-K program translates into your kindergarten. Your curriculum guides are not up to date. That's another meaning. The reason why they have to be updated is because the core curriculum content standards, if you've looked at them and I have, they have watered that stuff down. There is nothing in the core curriculum content standards that speaks to cultural diversity. So you're going to have to supplement your curriculum to make sure your kids get what they need. Can you imagine children going to school for 12 years in Newburgh and being lucky enough to go away to college and coming in contact with Chinese kids, with Japanese kids, with kids from South America, and that's what happens. And you're not familiar with different kinds of cultures. All you know is what you were exposed to. It's very important. It's very important. Now, for 
you stand, undoing racism is the way to fly. Ooh, it is rough. I've had the training five times, and every time I go, I cry. It's bleeding, because it makes you confront your demons. And all that racist nonsense you got going on in your head, you're teaching our kids or anybody's kids. You can't, you, you know, people bring their value sets with them when they come. Okay, they do. They can't help it. But what I'm saying about clock time is you have to be prepared to deal with all kinds of children. Teaching is an application. It's, it's a calling. Isn't it, Rev? Just like being a minister. Right, Rev Williams? Amen. So you can't um, negate that. That is so very, very important. Now, I'm going to stop because I can continue, but the last thing I wanted to tell you is that once you get your community organized, and I've been on a board that was threatened to be recalled, that is no joke. You can recall a board. Did you know that? You can recall your board of education if they're not meeting your needs of your children, and I'll tell you what you do. How do we do it? How do we do it? Well, you have some other steps you have to go through first, but I'll give you just an overview. The, the way you do it is you get a petition again, and the petition goes directly to the commissioner. Now, I don't want you to think if you did it that yours would be the first, because there are thousands of them up at the State Health Department. Um, the people in East Roundville did it, and I'll tell you the lady that was responsible, she was on it on Friday night. It took a lot of guts, but she did it. You had folks trying to sell a school that was assessed at $10.6 million, and they were trying to sell it to the, what was it, the Zedix? For something like $4 million. So three. Three, three Thank you. You can't do that. That's public money. What's your budget in uh, Newburgh? What's your budget? What was your budget for this year? Thirty-six. How much? Yes. School district. Say it again. It's closer to two hundred million. You have a fifteen million dollar deficit. Now, see, I don't live here. Why do I know that? You all need to know that. Now, what information is available to you? I bet you didn't know you can look at the superintendent, the valuation of the contract the superintendent has. You have access to that? After August 15th of every year. You know why I found that out? By reading your policies. Can you get access to the policies? Sure you can. I would suggest you do it through one venue, though, uh, with Reverend Williams, or, you know, President of the NAACP. But there isn't anything else folks are doing there that you all don't have access to. You put them there. Didn't you? <laughs> what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give this information to Reverend Williams because I promised him. When will the commissioner remove a member of the Board of Education from office? The commissioner has the power to remove a trustee member of the Board of Education and certain other school officers for woeful misconduct or neglect of duty. However, the commissioner will not remove a district officer unless it is clearly established that the officer acted intentionally and with a wrongful purpose to violate the law, neglect his duty, or disobey a decision order a regulation of the commissioner, and the commissioner will not remove a school officer if he or she has merely used poor judgment. I would think that would be one of the reasons why you would remove them. But the fact of the matter is that um, you have to organize your community. You really, really do. And what Wilbur told you about crossing over, you have to unite with your Hispanic parents. Right. So that you can go as a block and they recognize you as such because you pay taxes here and you have to demand that your kids get a quality education. You cannot have a closed shop. This is an open community and you have every right. And I saw this beautiful young lady sitting right here on TV. You're much prettier than person. Your name is Sade. 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 Okay, thank you. I, I remember that from a script that was up on top. Um, 
I'm just going to close by saying to you that uh, I really, really would like to see the school system move forward because you have so much potential. You have a principalship open a position at the high school. I think um, Newburgh Free Academy, they're looking for someone. The board policy, somebody should pull it so you can make sure that they adhere to the policy in terms of the hiring procedures is in the 3,000 section. You also have a deputy superintendent's position that has not been filled this year. You may or may not be aware of it. Ask for the table of organization so you can see who reports to whom. <laughs> at Central Office, right now, at Central Office, you have one African American. And that person is serving in the Office of Human Resources. He's an executive director. Uh, I said you have one African American. I just, you know, did that. You have a Hispanic. I think there are two. You don't have anybody at Central Office, really. But you know, don't why would you stand for that? We try. Wait a minute, we we not nothing beats a failure but a try. What we're gonna do is give you some suggestions as to how you can do that. You have you don't have enough people, you gotta go get everybody. You heard what the man said? You gotta get people to register to vote. Because if you don't, the same thing will go on. You keep doing things the same way, you're gonna get the same results. Your kids deserve better. How are they going to compete in a global environment if they don't have a solid education? I asked the question in the first meeting I came to. How many advanced placement classes do you have in high school? They couldn't even tell me. They didn't know. I did get it eventually. Now, I'm going to conclude by saying to you that um, you have to hold people accountable. You really do. Your superintendent, your board, you have to. Thank you very much for your time.
because they know there's a possibility. As of right now, they own it. And why do they think they own it? Because you've allowed them to think they own it. So they're doing what we're asking them to do because they know we can go to the feds and the NAACP, whether you like it or not, nationally has all kinds of power. Folks respond to that name. Especially when they know it's outside of the local arena. Once it gets out of there, they, they really kind of shake up. <laughs> then they figure they don't have no control. They control y'all, y'all don't vote. That's right. So with us, they see entirely different. So therefore they respond. But do know this. I'm not coming up here for you. That ain't my job. I was up been out every night this week, up in Monticello Tuesday night. Well, I had a thing in Rockland on last night, up here tonight. Got to be somewhere else Monday and Tuesday of next week. I don't have that. I, listen, I'm old. I mean, I'm old. I don't have that kind of stamina for sure. So I'm going to do what I can do and then expect you to do the rest. So because it's not my job. Say what? Well, that's true, but they got to come in the room. Folks that we answer 
to as well, and then the state office and national. And eventually, they will say enough is enough, whether we think it is or not. So, I do want to hear it, that it takes everybody. And you see, one of the things that happened, and I had to say this the other night after myself, everybody talks about the NAACP. The NAACP don't do this. The NAACP don't do that. The NAACP, well, who is the NAACP? Uh, Every last one of you here in Cooper has a law, and even those that don't are the law. But that, that's who it is. So when you say the NAACP is not doing nothing, I don't know why you're talking about yourself. Because <laughs> that's where it bounces back to. Now, what I would suggest <laughs> is that those people who are educators get involved with the education committee. Okay? Those who are not educators, listen to the ones who are. So that the train moves. Everybody can't be the engine. And nobody should be the caboose. You should fall somewhere in the middle of it. So that is the message that I was bringing up here. So like you said, you've been working, some ain't going to do it. It takes all. Because some get they get used to. And again, I can't stress this thing about voting. Because you need more people on that board. Now, I don't care how you're going to do it. What you got to do is you got to pick up people, get a wagon and a horse and drive them up to you. I don't care how you do it. You need more people on the board. Get the, there's no such thing as an old boys club unless you allow it to be the old boys club. So you need to get people on that board to do what you want to be done. And if they don't do it, get rid of them and find somebody else. This is a train that needs everybody. So you got to hold people, as kind of said, okay. And I, per, frankly, I don't think you have. Now part of that is because you didn't know what to hold accountable for. You, you hold accountable for educating kids, but you got to know the process of doing that uh, in order to really hold someone accountable. So any other questions of us? Yes.
the only African American female administrator at NFA who has the key qualities that I know people need the education, which is caring and compassion, who went above and beyond for all students, not only for the four basketball players, but for the 600 students that this administrator was responsible for. And she seems to be taking the fall for a systemic problem that everybody has acknowledged has existed in this district for many, many years. And why is it that the two white men got paid 50 to 100,000 dollars? I want you to know this. And I want to know why this branch of the NAACP isn't fighting over this wonderful person that I want to be in that high school when my grandchildren get there. Because this is the kind of person I want that's going to be helping my grandchildren. Yeah. My name is Abdul Rahman, and uh, I'm a social worker in the district. 
this will not be mentioned on the stage, but also in favor of the system that's what we're talking about. Yeah. You still can't hear me? Since I work for the district, and obviously this whole situation that was happening in the district is something that a little bit more than a lot of people may know and understand. A lot of things that were said today, obviously I understand the onus is on the community. Nobody expects anybody to come up and I understand the apathy in the community. Whenever you're doing a fight with social action, you're fighting against two things. You're fighting against the system and the apathy of the people who don't understand the charge. That is the nature of social action. I absolutely understand that. One of the things that I would like people to recognize is that, and this is for everybody in here, the NAACP does have that power, and in the mission of the NAACP is granting access to barriers for the individuals from the community. One of the things that I would like to know is, is there going to be a time when other organizations are going to be able to sit down and put together a strategic action plan, as was described by Dr. Frazier, because it's one thing to say everybody else has to do it, and we have to mobilize and do all that, but one of the other things is it's very difficult to come in and stay for a month, two months, six months and take a snapshot and understand you work. I've been here for four years and I understand all the street corners and all that and the rest of the kids over there. It's a very complex situation because you have to teach people how to fight. It's not about just saying go fight. You have, everybody in here, this is preaching to the choir for all of us because we're right here because we know right. Right. because we know what's at stake. Right. But when we leave here, and we walk down Liberty and Grand, they don't know that they're in a fight. So teach us somebody how to fight when they don't know they're in a fight because they don't know what's at risk. Because again, access to knowledge, access to these programs that we spoke about before about this program. It's not about having the programs, it's about removing the barriers and blockades to that. Since, as you said, you have the power to do things, and the is more of a monolithic thing that's gonna happen in the situation, <coughs> making yourself available to us so far has been wonderful. As long as we can guide and direct the things based on the environment council of the community, is that something the NAACP is going to be willing to do going in the future? Let me put it to you this way. I, I think I made that kind of clear. I thought I did, but maybe I did. You have educators here in this community. Right. Mm -hmm. It should be their responsibility and their charge to direct the fight. I'm not asking everybody to fight. Everybody shouldn't fight. We haven't asked anyone other than Reverend Williams, uh, Mrs. Bowles, and uh, Chester Johnson to go to these meetings with us. Now, the primary reason for that was, while we may be charging, we want them to know that there's someone here. They got some stuff to know we're not coming up here forever. So at the same token, the fight should be done by those people with the knowledge of how to fight. The other people just need to stand behind. And those folks, and the other folks who are learning from these educators are the ones to go to Grant Street or Grand Street or Liberty Street and spread the word of what it is. That's how you get people started. It's not just solely the NAACP. If you've heard everything we say here today and you don't go out and inform everybody that you know about the situation Woe on you. I understand what you're saying. That's not the maybe, maybe, from. Maybe, I'm not, maybe I'm not being clear. You're asking people, um, if I may, and Dr. McBride, do apologize, I'm going to put you a little bit on front street a little bit. All right? It's all right? All right. Even for those of us who have our masters in this district, we're still talking about the major things to block to access. Because even the people who have these degrees are not empowered. We have a man here who has a doctorate in curriculum instruction who was passed over in the third interview was created. Yeah. So before you really can come in and say from Rockland Trust, I got frat down there. Matter of fact, your cousin was my frat brother. You understand? So there are a lot of some things. I, there are a lot of things I should a little bit different. It's a little bit different. So you have to empower the ones who have actually already kicked in that door, who have already been stopping it, who have already gone out to become those leaders. that are still being blocked. And the thing that I'm asking is the power that you sit is there because everybody recognizing the place. Use your words, my brother. I'm not trying to put you on any kind of spot. What I'm saying is. In order for people to move forward, then maybe you have to knock with them in the tone. And that's what I'm asking. Is that going to be something that's available? I understand it's everybody else's problem. It's all about problem. That's right. It's all about problem. Any kid that looks like me doesn't look like me that's dying on the street, that's my problem. Right. You understand? Right. Any kid that's not going to have it like I want to have it, I shouldn't be the exception. I should be the regular. You understand what I'm saying? I got that point. 
what I'm saying is, what are we going to do from here? Because since you've done an amazing job on everything, all the leadership has to the next step have come from what you said. Now, as far as the access to the political side of it, the president doesn't want to have more doors to knock on. And if we do have people that are being led to certain places, we have to know what was asked to change so we know we can say, okay, that did happen. Because you're not going to be here. We're going to be watching that. Well, I just said we were coming back, and we would be telling you precisely what was, she just gave you the list of these acts for them for January. Right. We would be coming back saying what was accomplished, what wasn't accomplished. It doesn't have to necessarily come from me. Reverend Williams can tell you what was accomplished or not accomplished. Based upon that, then you know. We also would be saying what still needs to be accomplished. It is up to you then to follow up on the things that we have set up to ensure that they stay in place. Now, that doesn't require an access degree. That just requires some knowledge of what it's supposed to be. Now, as far as the your power, and I cannot say this enough, you will not have, we knocked on the door, they, they opened it. Because I am the regional director and it came from the regional director and from the state of New York, as well as national. Okay, the door opened. Your power of opening those doors and having some meaning is your vote. If you knock out there getting folks to register to vote, you won't have any power. I got to say, you should come to the end of that. That's what I'm saying. There are other people who are not members of the group. That's what I'm trying to That's no reason they can't pull out where you come yeah, so, so the answer is yes, you'll make it successful to the other organizations to move forward. You need to be asking him that. I'm not here. So he needs to be telling you that yes, they are accept. We will be acceptors, acceptors of other groups joining us, and I don't know why they wouldn't. And if they don't, you should certainly let me know, and I will find out why. But there's nothing wrong with collaboration between any group, as long as they fit within the realm. We do not go with folks that are out there. That's not our style. Our style is to go through the channels, if necessary, through the courts. We don't go fighting and carrying on and yelling and screaming and whatever, which is the reason that you know, so out. We don't we don't get down to that level. But we will take it behind the board. <laughs> With the drop of a hat. Okay. I'm Can I just interrupt for just a moment, please? I've just been informed that we can only be in the facility until nine o'clock. And we're getting close to that time. Just in response to that statement, I'll be waiting for the phone calls from any organizations that, that, that want to come in and collaborate. I'll be waiting to hear from them. Also, if you didn't sign in, we have sign in sheets at the back. Please sign in before you leave so we can keep registering who's here tonight. This lady over here, please come back. I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say as someone who has um, stepped forward in our community and uh, held office and fought the good fight and, and done all of those things, I don't know if our problem quite is not getting people out to vote. Right. It's not getting people, it's getting, getting people to get off their backsides and step up. You know, because we need to have people who are willing to run for these offices. Or you go around and say, will you run? Oh, no, I can't do that. Uh -uh, I can't do that. We don't have folks who are willing to put it on the line for our kids. So everybody in the room, take a turn. You know, I took a four year turn in hell. <laughs> and fought the good fight. Yeah. Okay, but you know, we you know we we need somebody else. I need to, to get that baton. Yeah. And when I held up that baton, nobody wanted to grab it. Right. We have to be willing to engage what is, okay? We have to be willing.
willing to engage with the demons. But I want to say that I know that voting is important. But here we are in an election season, and people know the condition of this city. Right. Right. They know what it looks like. We, the NAACP just had a debate, and none of the, the, the other candidates showed up. The Democrats was there. This hasn't been talked about. It hasn't been mentioned in the media. We have got to stop hallucinating with the patients. We have to stand up and take over this city. And I have asked, I have asked people to run for, for the school board. I was at a school board meeting. And you're right, I don't understand how any one person can be responsible for a systemic problem. If somebody was going to be fired, then, as my father used to say, fire a whole lot of them. You know, and, and move on. But you, you can't keep blaming one person. But what happens, and it happens consistently. Every day that I put my feet on the floor and start moving about my day, something happens to remind me that I'm black, that I may not be as educated, or that I'm this or that I'm that. And I move because I don't really care what other people think. I just move. We need to change our systems. We need to get some of these people off the city council who want to monopolize and pawn off the city. And we all know who they are. We need to get rid of the, the school board. If our kids are, are scoring in the lowest percentile, then what damn good are they? So when we're sitting around talking about what kind of change is needed, you know what's been, and you know that you need change, and you must tell everyone to get out and vote, and vote them out of the office. Thank you. What Wilbur said, I, I, I can stand here and testify that if you don't ask for it, it won't happen. When I, I live in Chester, which is 98% white, the 2% minority is 50% pure weakness. And they don't hold anything wrong with that. But when I became a legislator representing Tuxedo, Monroe, Warwick, my first year in the legislature, the county, I said they never, for the 36 years, never celebrated African History Month. I met with Harvey, and half of it became legislation that first February in 2006. In September, we had Hispanic Heritage Month celebrated. The first time in the history of our I'm no longer a legislator, but guess what? They never forget going forward. So if you don't ask for it, if you don't say it, if you don't demand of it, the first piece of the office are all white. But they make sure that is there on the roster every month, February and September. So don't be shy. You just go there and ask for the changes, and the changes will happen. Trust me. So it's not far fetched. Reverend Williams, sometimes he, I mean, the, the four years he was there celebrating. So, so he, he's, he can witness that also. So just to make you know that it's not hard to do, you just have to do it. Thank you. We want to, uh, we want to thank Mr. Aldridge for coming down tonight. And